In 19th century Europe, aspiring artists got their start by apprenticing themselves to working artists or by copying the work of great masters. They learned the techniques before developing an individual style or expression. The notion of building skills slowly may seem quaint to black-clad hipsters who are ready to make art now. But the Seattle Academy of Fine Art has built a national reputation by offering classical art training to thousands of people. So this is art heaven? <laughs> well, we sort of see it as a 19th century artist garret. <laughs> With lots of little stops. Yeah. So it's art. art heaven is clearly in the process of being created. We are today in the middle of the move, the construction, the painting, the plastering, and the IT work. Okay, all at once. So that's what everybody will hear as you and I talk. Where are we right this second? Uh, we're in a pretty special classroom for the Academy. It's called the Atelier Classroom. And this is the classroom where figure drawing goes on every morning, afternoon, and evening with dedicated teachers and apprentice students. So they're here five days a week working from their, with their teachers. So what is this room? This is one of the five classrooms in the building, but this one is specifically for a program called the Atelier Program. The students have chosen a teacher to study with over a long period of time, and they work five days a week on figure work with a morning, afternoon, or an evening Atelier teacher. So it's an intensive classroom. It's, it's a very long-term intensive commitment to studying a particular style of painting with a, with a professional instructor. And so you're partially moved into this space. The wooden easels are brand new. The model stand is here. Uh, our goal is to actually have very pure rooms and to build out major storage rooms with all the rest of the stuff, since we'd like the art school to feel, feel full of light and bright. Well, so you mentioned that those are new easels. Uh, what's funding this move? This seems like a huge expansion for you. Well, it's pretty incredible. Basically, 12 groups of people stepped up and funded the money. We weren't trying to do anything extraordinary. We were trying to do something on the level of a house renovation in terms of our budget. So we were trying to raise $150,000 in three months. And 35000 came from King County, and 11 other people stepped up and made almost the whole gift. And the rest were a lot of individuals. That's great. So you see the names on these studios? Mm -hmm. Each one of those persons gave at least a $10,000 gift. And we have 10 studios that are named. I know, we're very proud of ourselves. This is, uh, this does look like an artist garret. I know, isn't it great? This will be home to, to uh, an artist in residence, a faculty member? Wow, who? The, um, one of the plans with the building was to put at least four resident artists in the building. That would be doing professional work that students can interact with. And each professional artist mentors four, five, six, seven on-site full-time students who have small studio bays. But the faculty members have real studios. And we see this as our own kind of artist-in-residence program. And so the artist here is Michael Stasinos. And I notice that there's this wonderful skylight above us. This is a landmark building. Did, did Cornish put this kind of work in? Yes. The, the, the nicest new windows and skylights appear to have been installed sometime in the last five to six years. This is a wonderful room. I know. It's a gift. <laughs> this is a gift for a Seattle artist. I totally agree. And, you know, we have four such situations in the building. This is great. So. Uh, I'm assuming that these were a recent addition, all these bases well, on the walls. We knew we were going into construction. We knew we were painting. So when we had the drawing jam, we thought, we need white paper. We need to have everyone draw, and we'll give them the walls. <laughs> and because this will become the gallery of the school mm. in a gray-blue tone, I don't think it will ever look like this again. So this is kind of like when you, when you buy a new house that you need to fix up and you have the big wild party beforehand. Yeah, that was our wild party. We did it before everybody got here to take this place apart. So this is uh, work in, literally in progress. Work in progress. Enter. This is a classroom space? This is one of these mentored studios mm -hmm. where a total of 14 students work privately on 
work that's not with the model. In fact, this very space here, it's, it's, it's one group of students who are working with one teacher. This is where their drawing table is, where they will copy from masters, they will work from casts. It's a, this is actually, I think, our 19th century program. This is as close as we get to the Beaux-Arts. So this is a school where you have some students who can come and take a class. Right. Um, there's kids' programs, and then really the people who have put in more commitment that they right, really want right. to be artists. So there's a continuing ed quality to the school. So anyone can come, anyone can be a part of it, but as soon as you're ready to make a bigger jump, there's something here for you. There's a place for you to work, there's teachers who will work with you regularly, and there's more intense daily training. Now this is more than five times what you had at University Heights School. Four times. Four times. Four times. I thought it was right about that. It's big. How did us. you do all this there? We didn't. Okay. We did not have, this is, this is the culmination of a dream. I see. So we took models of art schools we really believed in and waited until finally we could start to implement pieces. So that the private studios for faculties and students, we have never had. I see. We've had the atelier program, but it's always move in, move out, move in, move out. Now there's a sense of being able to really focus it. So the 14 students will be able to keep their supplies and things in this space. It's their workspace. We call this their clubhouse. <laughs> we don't think they're coming out. We think that they probably they, won't. Once they're settled in here, I mean, they have a table they're going to build over here for grinding their own pigments. They have full-size casts that are going to be brought in. For do this is a four-year program for the most committed. Wow. Well, and it, it'll be fun to come back. And it's not, you know, it's, it's a different model than a modern art school. This particular atelier is an old-fashioned model. But we have other ateliers where they're a very expressionistic model or a modernist 20th century composition and painting. So is that grouped by what the students' interests are? The teacher. The teacher's interests. This is a teacher-driven program. Okay. You, if, you, if your mentor was Picasso or your mentor was Degas, you'd end up being a different kind of artist. So you pick your teacher, and that's where you fit in. So it's unusual that way. It's not program-driven. It's teacher-driven. Yeah, this is the biggest studio we have. It's about 1,500 square feet. It's got west-facing, north-facing, an incredible north-facing window, an extraordinary view, and a place where still life painting and figure painting goes on. It's really one of the major painting studios. Now you have, I've always thought of, of the academy as a painting academy. There's a sculpture there and a sculpture there. Are you also a sculpture academy? We are moving towards an incredible sculpture program. And we have a, a resident in-house sculpting instructor, and then we have several who also are local sculptors. And with the new building, we will have sculpting programs and multimedia and caustic. So on this floor that we've been walking through, is this primarily adult education that's happening on, on this floor? Yes, this is primarily adult, although the community functions, the library, the student lounge, the meeting room, the computers, the multimedia presentation room, the teens will have access to them. So there's, there are school-age programs, and they, some of them will happen in this? We program. have created year-long programs for teenagers, including a free Friday night program that's sort of our pride and joy. There's mm -hmm. so many teens show up. It's in a studio on the second floor, and 30 or 40 teens come. But for the children, we go to the schools. That's what I thought. Yeah. So those are in residence. Except for the summer. In the summer, the second and first floor are kids and teens. And the top floor is the monastery of art that will be for the adults. <laughs> so art heaven becomes the art monastery. And, yeah, I, I actually think there's going to be an ethos of sort of monastic study in the building. I think it's going to be a fairly mature group working. Now, I, I noted that Friday, February 13th is the official You've slated that as, right. as an opening day. Things will be up and running? We'll have a school running, but at the same time, we're going to have an opening celebration. We're going to have a ribbon cutting. It will be a different kind of ribbon cutting. We will have cake. We will have balloons. We will have artists. But it, we're calling it It's Our Lucky Day, Friday the 13th. Yes, it's going to be a big party. Well, thank you so much for the tour. Well, thank you. So where are we?
are we? What is this room? <laughs> this room, which we fondly refer to as the black box, is uh, one of our five classrooms. And what's interesting about this building is that uh, it was almost as though it was made to order for our peculiarities as a school because we have enough programming to use, say, three, four, five classrooms. But there's all these other little spaces here, these sort of oddball spaces that I'm not sure what an ordinary school would have done with. But we've always had this vision that we wanted to uh, provide a, a, a roof for artists who went through many of our programs and then were ready to start working on their own, but weren't quite ready to be off in a loft building somewhere with their own studio and the blank, and the blank canvas, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden, no more input. So for years and years, we've been talking about this idea of having studios as part of the campus, which is the grad student model. But this isn't a school like a, a, an American graduate school. It's more like a, a European art school, right? You know, or, it, or is it its own thing altogether? It's its own thing altogether. I mean, there's very few. Uh, art education used to be the province of sort of standalone art schools. And then after World War II, university art departments you know, took, took art education over. And uh, the independent art schools almost, uh, you know, has almost become extinct. So since we're an independent art school and, uh, and and uh, you know, proud of it, and likely to remain so. Uh, we, you know, we don't have a lot of models out there for the sort of school we want to be. Well, you started painting late in life, didn't you? Later I, than I mean, you weren't somebody who picked up a pencil at the age of six. And I, the the school, as it exists now, would probably not be around. At least I wouldn't have started it had it not been for that fact. I mean, that's that's really one of the crucial the crucial elements in the origin of the school because a lot of my friends who are professional artists, they, they learned sort of the ropes uh, so early on. And if it's a guy typically from copying uh, comic book illustrations, ah. it's like the classic door into being an artist is uh, falling in love with comics when you're a kid. But I never did any of that and uh, nobody ever told me that I had any talent. I had this epiphany when I was 24, and uh, I, for the first time, actually sat down and drew something and looked at it at the same time instead of just trying to make it up. And I drew the sleeping bag that I was sitting in. I drew my feet in the sleeping bag. And it was an aha moment. And, oh, oh, you mean you can do this if you actually have something to look at. Well, I know that you make a distinction about being learning to to draw or paint and and talent. That talent isn't really in your mind what it's about. It's about being taught to do it, taught to see and taught to draw. Yeah, it's there's this odd idea that everybody knows if you want to learn to play the piano, and somebody takes you into a room and sits you down at the piano and say, "Okay." go for it, express yourself, and you just make awful noise. Well, of course, you know, I mean, first you have to learn the fingering and the notes and to read music and timing and all that other stuff. Same thing with learning a language. But people have always, in recent years, and of course this wasn't true 100 years ago, it wasn't even true 70, 50 years ago, but, you know, in the modernist era, uh, there's, been, there's been this idea that... Uh, uh, art was all in the conception and that the actual ex execution was sort of beside the point. That if you had a good enough idea that you would somehow make it see the light of day. Uh, but, you know, I have exactly the opposite idea. I have this idea that uh, uh, that there's an inner artist trapped in lots of people who just assume they're not artists because they have no way to express themselves in the simplest way possible, which is paper and pencil. They, they can't make that direct statement, here's my idea and here's what I'm thinking about and do a drawing. So I know that there is, a, in some sense, a way that this school is modeled on the, I guess, 18th and 19th century European, particularly Parisian school or Italian. People would apprentice themselves to artists and then 
make their paint for them and then watch how they worked and then do what they did. Isn't that right? Right. Yeah. No, we think that's a really, that's a really cool model. I mean, the whole idea was that uh, uh, being around a working artist is learning on a, on a whole series of levels at once. So you see how they approach making a picture. You see how they run their life. You see how they run their studio, as well as learning technical skills. And this, this physical plant gives us the opportunity to carry that model much further than we were able to before. We visit, visited some of the atelier spaces that, that the professional artists will have, and then the spaces that, that students will have in close proximity. They'll be working with artists in, who work in particular styles. They attach themselves to the teachers rather right. than the other way around. Right. Yeah, see, we're instructor-driven. We're not program-driven. So we kind of build our school around the particular talents of the artists who are our faculty. I, at, at some point in time, you used to be the Seattle Academy of, of Realist Art, and now you're the Seattle Academy of Fine Art. What's the distinction between those two? Yeah, well, that's a good question. Uh, political. <laughs> it's a political distinction. I mean, I had, you know, I, uh, uh, when we started the school, and, you know, it was sort of a ma and pa operation, uh, I just had a bee in my bonnet about the way that the art establishment uh, was uh, saw representation as being completely anathema to anything that modern art could possibly be interested in. And so I picked the name, the Academy of Realist Art, because it had two words in it that were really annoying to, to uh, sort of the mainstream art establishment, academy and realist. But I always knew that uh, it was a little limiting at the same time because we, uh, you know, all, uh, common expectation to the contrary, we actually don't see ourselves as producing uh, generations of realists to go out there in the world and do do paintings in the tradition of 19th century academic painting. I mean, that's not what we're about. Well, in fact, if people see some of your work, I, I suppose only that there's things represented in it, would I think of it as realist art. You're, a lot of, of work of yours, you had a big show at the Fry, for example, that I, I think of as kind of surreal <laughs> rather than realist. Yeah, well, it, it's, it, it's, it's representational. It's not realist. It's not realism. And, and there's a separation. In there's a separation. I had never gone to art school, and I was 26 years old, and I decided that this is what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. Uh, and I went to the local library and got every art school catalog off the shelf, and saw where I would fit in. And I, I knew that I didn't want to just sign up for a four-year program, that I wanted to be able to direct my own education. I also knew that I had no portfolio because I'd never gone to art classes. There's this contradiction where you already have to be good at art in order to go to art school. Uh, so as soon as I picked up the Art Students League catalog, all these other catalogs, you know, they said require, interest requirements. They wanted this many hours of this kind of class in a secondary school. They wanted this portfolio. You had to have your slides labeled such and such a way. They would review them. The Art Students League admission requirements, there are none. Next paragraph. That's it. It was a one-line statement. There are no admission requirements. The only requirement is a desire to learn. So that's part of your model. But then you have a drawing jam for the community. So we have anybody can come in. Anybody can participate. Some people can stay. Right. Yeah, the drawing jam is, uh, I mean, we, we, we see ourselves as, uh, you know, uh, we, we're about social change in a way <laughs> as well as just art education. I mean, we, we want to change people's idea of what an art school means. I mean, I've always been very intimidated by art schools. I mean, you know, you, you see all these sophisticated looking people hanging out between classes. And uh, I always felt when I was 
you know, walking from the outside looking in, that it represented a sort of another, a, a, a different, more sophisticated level of humanity than I could ever hope to aspire to. Uh, whereas we really want to welcome the community in, but we want to welcome the community in be, because we want to get people as excited about some of the things we think are cool um, as we are. And so the drawing jam is meant to be a celebration of drawing. In all the permutations of the, of the contemporary art world, I think that there's always this danger that it's going to become a, a exclusionary. So it's since performance art and video art and computer art and multimedia art are the styles that so many uh, museum shows have been devoted to, so many young artists are working with, then that means we can't draw from the model anymore because that's over. And you know, we, we just don't see it that way. We, we, we see that something that's that vital and, and creates such an intense relationship between the artist and their subject and, it's, and has inspired and continue to inspire so much good and great art. You know, we don't see any point in just abandoning that because that was then and this is now. And you know, I, I, I see art as being so much more multifarious and unpredictable than that. We congratulate you so yeah. much on, on your move and your expansion. Thanks so much for taking time to talk to us. Uh, sure. Thanks for coming by and checking us out. Yeah.